Welcome to this edition of Cranmer Studies. We'll be jumping around a little bit with St. Paul. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? Turn now to Gerald Bray's documents of the English Reformation. The break before the break with Rome. It is universally acknowledged that study and dissemination of the Bible one of the most central aspects of the European Reformation. <clears throat> the process of rendering sacred texts in the language of the people began with the work of John Wycliffe and his Lollard associates, who produced two versions of the Bible in English, both of them translated from the Latin Vulgate. <clears throat> The first of these editions was put out in 1380, and the second about 1388, after Wycliffe's death. The first Lollard Bible was condemned as heretical, but the second, by a strange irony, was accepted as Catholic, and even recommended by people as indisputably orthodox as Sir Thomas More. However, this version remained in manuscript and was never widely available. Moreover, by a decree held at Oxford in 1408, it was forbidden to translate or even read the Bible in English without special permission. The New Testament of the second version was not published until 1731, and both versions were published together fully only in 1850. Historians now agree that Lollardy in England existed at the time of the Reformation, but it is uncertain how strong it was. On balance, it seems that the surviving Lollards were attracted into the Reformers group rather than the first Reformers were affected by contemporary Lollardy. Whatever the truth of the matter, there is little sign of no direct Lollard influence on the first printed version of the English New Testament, which was prepared by William Tyndale, 1494 to 1526, an early convert to Lutheranism. Tyndale followed Luther in many respects, but his translation of the New Testament was an independent rendering from the Greek, not a calc from Luther's Germany, and it is a superior translation. Tyndale's English is noted for its freshness, which has stood this test of time. He himself revised his work in 1534 and again in 1535, but it is the 1534 version which is now accepted as the standard the preface printed here from that edition and includes a separate section at the end condemning the efforts of one John Joy to improve Tyndall's work. Tyndall tried to gain support for the translation in English, but the Bishop of London was hostile. And in 1524, he felt it would be wise to flee England. He went to Wittenberg, Hamburg, Cologne, and finally Antwerp. He was arrested there in 1535 and taken to Vilvorda near Brussels, where he was imprisoned and subsequently executed. There is some evidence that Henry VIII tried to save him, but he was never pardoned by the English king for breaking the law of 1408 against translation and his name remained virtually unmentionable until well into the reign of Elizabeth I. This did not deprive him of influence, however, because his translation formed the basis of all subsequent Protestant translations. And it's estimated that up to 90% of the authorized King James Version of 1611 can be traced to him. The theology. Tyndale's New Testament is substantially a Lutheran product, 
as the preface of the prologues to the various books clearly indicate. In particular, the prologue to the Epistle of Romans is no more than a translation of Luther's, with five additional paragraphs appended at the end. Tyndale also followed Luther's order of the New Testament, relegating Hebrews, James, Jude, and Revelation to the status of an appendix. It is known that Luther did this because he doubted the canonicity of the books, but Tyndale's position on this is unclear. Certainly there is nothing in his extant writings which would suggest that he doubted the full authority of these books. Hello again, Mary. We're talking about Tyndale. Tyndale goes beyond Luther, however, in his understanding of the Bible as covenant, a view which would later give rise to the most characteristic type of Puritan theology. In the preface, he gives us a very clear explanation of what he means. Later, in his response to George Joy, a fellow laborer, he develops his belief in sola scriptura, a Lutheran formula which he nevertheless understands in his own way. Tyndale not only wished to affirm what scripture affirms, he also wished to deny what scripture does not clearly affirm. It was this second aspect of his thinking which was to become a major bone of contention between the conformists and nonconformists after the Elizabethan settlement of 1559. Notabene, that paragraph numbering is included in this edition for ease of reference and was not in the original text. And here we listen to the preface by Wind William Tyndale. Here thou hast, most dear reader, the New Testament or covenant made with us in Christ's blood, which I have looked over again now at last with all diligence and compared it unto the Greek and have weeded out its many faults, which lack of help at the beginning and oversight did so therein if aught seemed changed or not altogether agreeing with the Greek, let the finder of fault consider the Hebrew phrase or manner of speech left in Greek words, whose preterperfect tense and present tense is often just one, and the future tense is the optative mode also, and the future tense is often the imperative mode in the active voice, and the passive ever. Likewise, person for person, number for number, and an interrog interrogation, inter interrogation for a conditional. This was common in Hebrew use. I have also in many places set light in the margin to understand the text. If a man finds fault either with the translation or with anything beside, <clears throat> which is easier for many to do than so well to have translated it themselves from their own pregnant wits. To the same it shall be lawful to translate it themselves and to put what they desire thereto. If I shall perceive either by myself or information of another that anything has escaped me, or might be more plainly translated, I will shortly after cause it to be amended. Albeit many places me thinketh it better to put a declaration in the margin than to run too far from the text. And in many places where the text seems at the first chop hard to understand, yet the circumstances before and after and often reading together makes the text plain. And we'll continue that in our next session, William Tyndale's preface to the English translation. We turn now to a professor of mine, now deceased professor, 
Edgecombe Hughes, The Theology of the English Reformers and the Importance of Preaching and its Recovery in the English Reformation. Pointing to the sloth and negligence against which they were contending as reformers, he reminded them of the cry of the prophet. This is Bishop John Jewell. Woe unto me, because I have kept silence. And then also the affirmation of the apostle. Woe unto me, if I preach not the gospel. Quote, if Christ, if the apostles... And if the prophets had held their peace, in what case had we now been in, asks Jewel. What religion had there been anywhere? What worship of God had there been? Thus we behold the light that having escaped out of bondage, that we are accounted to be sons of God, and all of this owing to the preaching of the word of God, close quote. And Jewell warns them in this sermon at Christ Church, Oxford, that unless they have this in remembrance, all that has been gained by the Reformation could well be lost. This is 1551. Quote, the victory is kept by the same means as it was obtained. To take the voice of the pastor away from the church is to leave religion haphazard, blind, confused, and to mingle everything with error, superstition, and idolatry. Quote, it is the mark of a pastor not so much to have learnt many things as to have taught much, he asserts, and admonishes his hearers that any of the flock of the Lord shall perish through our default, his blood will be required at our hands. It is not for the pastor to complain that the people are deaf and ungrateful. This is no excuse for silence, but rather a challenge to preach still more with frequency and urgency. The more serious the disease, the greater need for the physician. Again, the stubbornness of the people should not be allowed to upset the preacher unduly. Let us persevere with our task and leave the success to the Lord, Jewel counsels. For as it is our duty to instruct the people with words, so it belongs to God to join his word, faith and force. Such is the power of the word of God, that to affect nothing and to profit no one is impossible. Therefore, the truth must be spoken not lies, the scriptures, not fables, the precepts of the Most High, not the dreams of men. For religion must be ordered not by our judgment, but by the word of God. It was indeed because of the serious decay of preaching that Thomas Cranmer's Book of Homilies were published the first during Cranmer's archbishopric, and the second book of homilies after Elizabeth had come to the throne in 1559. Their contents were intended to be read regularly in the church by those clergy who were incompetent to preach sermons. But the reading of these homilies was never meant to supplant the preaching of sermons. Their publication and the homilies is a big deal in Anglican history. It's been forgotten, but the the doctrines of salvation, the whole kit and caboodle is there. Their publication was designed as a temporary expedient to tide the church over until such time as there should be an instructed and competent ministry. Today, they remain a valuable repository of certain aspects of Reformation teaching. There's an interesting comment on the scope of the homilies in a letter from Archbishop Grindle to the Queen, dated 20 December 1576, where it is thought, he writes, that the reading of godly homilies set forth by public authority may suffice 
I continue of the same mind as I was when I attended last upon your majesty. The reading of the homilies is a commodity that is nothing comparable to the office of preaching. The godly preacher is termed in the gospel, fidelis servus et prudens, faithful servant and prudential servant, qui noet familiato domini, Kivum dimensum dare tempore, who can apply his speech according to the diversity of times, places, and hearers, which cannot be done in the homilies. Exhortations, reprehensions, and persuasions are uttered with more affection to the moving of the hearers in sermons than in written homilies. Besides, homilies were devised by the godly bishops in your brother's time, Edward VI, only to supply necessity for want of preachers and are by the statute not to be preferred to give place to sermons whatsoever they may be had and were never thought in themselves alone to contain sufficient instruction for the Church of England. If every flock might have a preaching and teaching pastor, which is rather to be wished than hoped for, then were the reading of these written homilies unnecessary. But to supply that want of preaching of God's word, which is the food of the soul, both in your brother's time and in your time, certain godly homilies have been devised that the people should not be altogether destitute of instruction. For it is an old and true proverb, better half a loaf than no bread. The primacy of teaching. In his catechism, Thomas Beacon, another English reformer, describes it as the first and principal point of a bishop's spiritual Bishops and spiritual minister's office is to teach and preach God's word and denounces the non-preaching parson as a Nicholas Bishop, that is, a mock St. Nicholas Day boy bishop, and an idol, and indeed no better than a painted bishop on a wall. Yea, he is, as the prophet saith, a dumb dog not able to bark. He is also, as our Savior Christ saith, unsavory salt, worth for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the foot of men. Woe be to those rulers that set up such idols with white daubed walls over the flock of Christ, those whom he has purchased with his precious blood. Again, Beacon writes in the preface in his work entitled The Demands of Holy Scripture, that as there cannot be a greater jewel in the Christian commonwealth than an earnest, faithful, and constant preacher of the Lord's word, so there cannot be a greater plague among people than when they have reigning in their pulpits, blind guides, dumb dogs, wicked wolves, hypocritical hirelings, popish prophets, which feed them not with the pure wheat of God's word, but with the wormwood of men's trifling traditions. And we shift from Prof. Hughes to the article on the worthy communicant. And what does that mean? We're talking about the prayer books. The practical prayer book was the one thing that Cranmer left a great legacy in the Anglican communion. The practical problems alone that were created by overturning of the custom of time immemorial would have been enormous. The rearrangement of church space to accommodate new requirements perhaps the provision of a new communion plate to accommodate the influx of new communicants. If there was nobody to communicate, could there be no celebration? I'm not sure where he's going here. Practically speaking, 
how was the communion of the people to be administered? The existing order of the mass made no provision for the people. The problem, at least, was anticipated and answered in the order for communion, prefaced by a royal proclamation and distributed to the schools, colleges, and parish churches for use after 1 March 1548 first time an English version of public worship was ordered up. Before, before considering the contents of the order, it's worth noticing the deliberate rapidity with which the reform gathered movement soon after Henry's death. It is remarkable by the standards of modern liturgical revision the more so when we remember the very rudimentary means of production and distribution of material in the 16th century, quite apart from the work of preparing what it was to be produced. That's because Cranmer had been working on it. This is especially true of the 1549 prayer book, a detailed and complicated piece of work by any of standards but one that does not bear the marks of hasty composition. To a lesser degree, the same is true also of the 1548 order. Rather, less than four months between the passing of the Act of Parliament and its delivery, hot off the press, to the altars of 10,000 parish churches, is altogether too unrealistic a time scale for both composition and production and distribution. The implication is that both the policy of the reform of worship and also the program of its execution had already been decided by the end of 1547, some nine months, ten months after Henry's death. And much of the material of this projected prayer book in English was, at the very least, in an advanced stage of preparation. Thomas Cranmer himself is known to have been interested in the revision of the daily office, morning prayer, evening prayer, as early as 15, 43 and 44. The reformers had the advantage over liturgical revisers of later generations. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and that their proposals were introduced and carried out not synodically, but by the king in parliament. While the convocations that was gathering of the clergies in York and Canterbury appear to have been consulted on issues of practical detail and to sound out the opinions, the main proposals were not themselves open for discussion. This procedure leaves much less to chance and is far less open to the tactics of delay or obstruction. The order of the communion of 1548 is not, therefore, to be seen as an emergency measure or stopgap response by the church to the act of parliament. It is the liturgical and ex expression of the intention of the parliamentary act and furnishes the rationale of it in such a way that the communicant who uses this order attentively will be left in no doubt about what he is doing and what he is happening when he is taking and receives the sacrament faithfully and devoutly. In the brief months before the publication and introduction of the 1549 Book of Common Prayer, the order was used for the administration of communion of people after the communion of the priest at the end of the Latin Mass. Part of its contents are so familiar as to be known by heart by all practicing Anglicans of mature your sins, the confession, the absolution, the comfortable words, that glorious prayer of humble access, and the words of administration, the body, 
of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for thee. Preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. Take eat this in remembrance that Christ died for thee. After the communion, the people depart with the familiar blessing of the prayer book. Much less familiar, though, even to the most regular Anglican worshiper, are the preceding exhortations, which have long been quietly neglected. The first day is the notice to be given on the Sunday of the Holy Day beforehand of the intention to celebrate. Upon day, space, next. I do intend by God's grace to offer to all such as shall be godly disposed the most comfortable sacrament of the body and blood of Christ to be taken in remembrance of his most fruitful and glorious passion. The intending communicants are then reminded of the benefits of the passion. Our sins are forgiven and we are made partakers of the kingdom of heaven. We will pick that up as he goes through the Holy Communion service of the 1549 Book of Common Prayer. We're now with Prof. McCulloch on salvaging the claw cause, 1539-42, six articles, 1539. Henry's alive. Cromwell will get his head cut off in 1540. Cranmer's particular concern was to knock down Henry's arguments for compulsory clerical celibacy. But he also advanced an interesting argument <clears throat> bearing on the German and English campaigns against the Anabaptists the previous autumn. He drew Henry's attention to the situation in the Habsburg ruled Low Countries where thanks to severe official persecution, toleration of idolatry and lack of good teachers, many of the people are becoming open atheists. For it is a fact that there's an almost pagan license in the low countries where some are superstitious by nature and others embrace the lunatical doctrines of the Anabaptists, close quote. It was an argument for the evangelical middle way, which would have appealed to Booser and Cranmer. But it has rather missed the target of Henry VIII's own vision of the via media. Henry would not appreciate being lectured even by one for an evangelical for whom he felt deep admiration. I take that back. That is Philip Melanchthon's hot objection to Henry and the six articles. Cromwell had his own ideas about the important religious work contemplated by Parliament and how it might be shaped. He cheerfully told Henry VIII in March that he had made sure that his henchman, Richard Morrison, an effective and none too scrupulous evangelical propagandist, would be elected as an MP to answer and take up such as would crack or brag, brag or show off with literature of learning. And in general, the elections would produce never more tractable parliament for the king. There was no reason to suppose that evangelical plans had been derailed. Most spectacularly of all, Cromwell's greatest achievement the first edition of the newly official authorized Bible, the Great Bible, appeared in April 1539 from the presses of the enthusiastically evangelical official publishers Richard Grafton and Edward Whitchurch. Its title page, to become familiar in later editions of the work, was a spectacular piece of reformist iconography as masterfully planned in Renaissance humanist fashion as Cranmer's newly devised archiepiscopal seals. Possibly it is another candidate for attribution to Hans Holbein, 
like so many pictorial title pages, it took advantage of the usual format to present a two-fold message either side of the central title block. However, the message was not of violently contrasted episodes, as would be the case, for instance, in the famous later title book page of Fox's Book of Martyrs, where superstition and true religion fight for dominion for the human soul before the throne of Christ. In the great Bible, the message was one of unity, two estates, clerical and lay, harmoniously and gratefully receiving the word of God from the hands of the benevolent king and drawing from it the preferred message of discipline and obedience. The story of the title page to the great Bible ran from top to bottom at the king's right hand to receive the Bible and lead his fellow bishops was Cranmer, formally and traditionally tonsured, and in the frame below he handed on the book to the clergyman, who below, out in the parishes, passed on the word of God from the pulpit with the loyal inscription, Vivat Rex, long live the king. Meanwhile, the king's left hand, Cromwell, the vicegerent, also received the Bible with a rather too accurately bored looking set of privy counselors behind him. In the frame below, he went out personally distributing the Bible to the lay people. At this level of the page, both Cranmer and Cromwell were identified by their coats of arms. Although Cromwell's heraldry disappeared through political circumstances after the third edition, leaving an embarrassing blank circle in later versions. The iconography faltered below the vicegerent's panel, the artist clearly being unable and unsure on how the word of God was conveyed, conveyed from the better sort among the laity to their social inferiors. Whilst on the other side, one half of the people sat attentively below the preacher's pulpit. The rest of the population milled around confusedly, but cheerfully under Cromwell. Yet all, whether in church or elsewhere, took up the message from the word of God, vivat rex, a few little children around the pulpit, not up to the Latin in their schooling, did their best with God save the king. At the viewer's extreme lower right, opposing the loyal pulpit, there was silence from a fairly obscured, delineated set of inhabitants of a prison. No, no doubt a motley band of observant friars and Anabaptists in the tower. The Bible was not the only index of evangelical confidence. Cranmer was still working away on his liturgical reforms of the vernacular offices and the king was still scared stiff of a joint hostile alliance between the Pope, the Emperor, and the King of France. The most likely conclusion to be drawn from this was that Henry would respond by paying renewed attention to his contacts with the Lutheran princes. These were indeed showing much promise. By late April, Vice Chancellor Burchard was back in England at the head of another Lutheran delegation, looking for financial help for the German princes, but also determined to build on Melanchthon's exhortations and move the king from his disastrous rear affirmation of clerical celibacy in the Six Articles of 1539. Cromwell wrote to the king warmly, commending the evangelical mission from Germany, particularly on the grounds that it would annoy the emperor. 
this was not a judicious note by Cromwell to the king, in which, to finish his letter, Cromwell began to discover that Henry was now thinking along very different lines. The king brooded on his threatened diplomatic isolation from the continental princes. There was little in the new German proposals to excite him. Indeed, the Germans made more demands than offers. It was no doubt particularly galling that his fervent efforts to meet and get Melanchthon from Saxony to England were not accepted, but were rudely rebuffed. Henry was sensitive to such rebukes, accordingly, which had Luther behind them. Accordingly, he came to the opposite conclusion to his stance in the previous year. He now preferred to concentrate on wooing conservative opinion at home, that would be the Anglo-Papists, and to woo abroad than wooing Lutherans of Northern Europe. We'll continue that geopolitical theological story tomorrow. We are now in Arthur Ennis's Cranmer and the Reformation in England, and we just talking about the hand of Cromwell, 1534 to 1540. <clears throat> now the whole country, try to get some dates in here, was required to su subscribe to the act of succession. Elizabeth the first has been born in September 1533, and now there's a parliamentary act to say that Mary, Henry's daughter of 1516, is literally a bastard, that's the word used, and Elizabeth the one first is to be the heir if Henry were to die. But the form of the oath prescribed after the act was passed involved also a preamble abjuring Rome and affirming royal supremacy. It might well be maintained that the main part of the oath was a necessity to put all possible dispute out of question in the future. And even those who would uphold Mary's claim in theory might be required and expected to pledge themselves in act to Elizabeth. But it was obvious that to uphold papal authority in the church or to deny the possibility of recognizing a layman as her head could not reasonably be perverted into treason or even into disloyalty. Now it's one thing to demand all the subjects of the realm that they shall obey the law and another to compel them upon pain of being held guilty of treason to swear that they agree with the principle on which the law was passed. <clears throat> it is not possible to suppose that the oath was constructed with any of your object than the creation of an excuse for the humiliation and the destruction of any and all who denied the royal supremacy of Henry VIII. Thomas More and Bishop Fisher were ready to swear to the succession, but not to the supremacy. And so were the monks of the London, London Charter her House, the observance of Greenwich and the brigantines of Bradford. Cranmer was innocent enough to try to persuade the king to be content without insisting on the preamble to the act. He had not realized that the object in view was to get his oath refused, not to get it accepted. The recalcitrants were put in jail. Of the monks who protested, some did give way. In November, 1534, the act was renewed, this time including the form of the oath retrospectively to give some color of law to the penalty heretofore illegally enforced. An act was passed 
declaring the king to be the supreme head, which had yet only been affirmed in the clerical convocation. A new Annates bill was passed, no more money to Rome, appropriating that to the crown, the first fruits, which had been drawn, withdrawn by previous acts. And a new Treasons Act was passed by which the expression of opinion or even the refusal to express an opinion was converted into high treason, hitherto confined by the act of Edward III to specific actions against the king. Thomas More and Bishop Fisher remained stubborn. Some of the monks also recanted their submission, and the result was a series of quasi-judicial murders which, uh, which shocked Christendom on the continent and Christendom in England, but at the same time testified conclusively to the complete ruthlessness of the methods that the king was resolved to adopt. There is no doubt that this ruthlessness was, by, by these means, congenial to Cranmer's liking. Himself a gentle and forgiving disposition, he never relinquished an amiable belief that he could persuade recalcitrants of all sorts to see the errors of their way and an amiable desire to persuade the king to grant pardons on terms of submission. We'll pick up that discussion as we turn now to Leslie Williams, the emblem of faith untouched on the archbishop. This is late 1532. He's on the continent as an ambassador for Henry to the court of the Roman Emperor, Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. Why did Henry pick Cranmer after Archbishop Warham died in August, on August 22, 1532? Public opinion was divided. Cranmer's enemy, enemies claimed he, was, he won the post through flattery or bribes. Harking back to his days with Joan at the Dolphin Inn, 1515, where he married she died in childbirth and he came back into he went into holy orders <clears throat> finished his bachelor of divinity went on to get his doctor of divinity rumors spread that he didn't deserve this appointment because he was a lowly hostler that is one who keeps the horses out in the barn that he was a hostler and not a scholar cranmer's close association with anne boleyn before the marriage, helped him in Henry's eyes. One anti-Cranmer writer reported that when Cranmer tried to thank Henry for his promotion, Henry replied he ought to thank Anne Boleyn. True, Cranmer's association with Anne didn't hurt his chances for promotion. However, Cranmer did not play on their friendship for a game. In fact, he remained loyal to the Bolins long after it was popular to be their friend, doing what he could for Anne and her father, who'd fallen out of favor with the king. Cranmer's colleague, Stephen Gardner, that's quite a name, who ran into Cranmer at Waltham in the fateful days of 1529 that ended up getting Cranmer transferred from Cambridge to Henry's royal service, had worked for the king longer than Cranmer and might have been the king's first choice, except that while Cranmer was on the continent in 1532, Gardner, who was a bishop of Winchester, Wiley Winchester, they called him, led a defense of the church's liberties against Henry this move likely cost him the archiepiscopal see. With typical shrewdness, Henry probably selected Cranmer because he knew Cranmer would not fight too hard against him. He was a lapdog, in my opinion. 
Cranmer's temperament was affable, a private man. He sought to please those in authority. Gardner might have been the more logical choice for the archbishop, except for his strong, strident, and devious personality, which would have been more difficult for the king to control. Gar Cranmer and Gardner had already parted ways theologically. Cranmer with the Reformation leanings and Gardner with strong Roman sympathies. Both men had committed potentially fatal career moves and both bounced back. After his disagreement with Henry, Gardner wrote a treatise commending his loyalty to Henry's cause, a piece of sycophancy. And Cranmer returned to England, keeping his wife's existence secret. When Cranmer was appointed Archbishop, Gardner and Cranmer found each other political antagonists as well. And that's a story with extra chapters in it, Cranmer and Gardner. Their, their rivalry would outlast King Henry and would remain to the very bitter end, including Cranmer's burning at the stake, 21 March, 1536. After a lollygagging on his way home from the continent, upon arrival in England, Cranmer could no longer escape the inevitable. Because Anne Boleyn was already pregnant in October or November of 1532, Henry needed a new primate immediately, a lapdog to do his bidding. Normally, the sea stood empty for about a year so that the crown could collect the revenues from the, 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 the Episcopal see. But Henry decided to forego all that and rush through the documents to Rome because he was in a hurry and business need to, needed to go like a hypersonic bullet train. After Cranmer arrived in England after lollygagging in January 1533, buckle up because we're going to be doing 90 miles an hour, the great machinery of chain, change hummed at full throttle over the next five months, creating with breakneck speed a new queen, a new heir, and a new church. In January, Henry and Anne held a private wedding ceremony, formalizing the union. Elizabeth had been conceived in late November, maybe early December. Records indicate that Henry and Mary, Henry and Anne married January 25, 1533 although alternate sources claim they were married November 1532. At any rate, they held some sort of private ceremony with a priest in January. Cranmer, just in from the continent, settled into a temporary home in Cannon Row between the palaces of Westminster and Whitehall, lodgings that provided easy access to the committee, he left his wife back in Germany. He would be involved in for the next few months before his, his installation as Archbishop. And before he was officially uh, um, in the Archbishop's Palace of Lambeth across the river. The flurry of committee work involved resolving questions such as whether Catherine and her first husband, Henry's brother Arthur, had had sexual relations, creating parliamentary legislation forbidding any to appeal to a power outside the realm of England by, by Rome, easing Cranmer's own doubts about the authority to be confirmed as archbishop and going over in more subtle and detailed arguments for the impending annulment hearings. Working with England's leading divines, Cranmer managed to prove that the Pope's lordship was not scriptural, but had accrued over the centuries by human desire for ambition. 
The highest power belonged to the kings of the realm, bishops, including the bishops of Rome, by God's commandment, were subjects just like any other person living within a commonwealth. Therefore, the Bishop of Rome should have no power outside of Italy. With proper legislation, his authority could and should be driven out of England, remaining in Italy as a river is kept within its banks. Thus, the committee work set the stage for the legal proceedings to bring about these momentous changes. Before anything else, Henry, Henry had to get the legal permission from Rome for Cranmer to be consecrated. There's still some very close ties. Cranmer needed to be stamped and certified with papal bulls from Rome before Parliament and Convocation. To expedite the process of getting the papal bulls authorized, Henry helped Cranmer financially with the enormous expense surrounding the installation of the new archbishop and for the preparation of his household. Part of the cost included the purchase of a new fine woolen pallium, or Paul, the symbol of his office. Henry was able to get papal permission quickly, and indeed, and one reason why was that the Pope's representative in England knew how much money the Roman Church would lose in revenue should the English Church refuse its payment of annual annates to Rome, as Henry had been threatening. His job was to placate Henry. In the meantime, Henry kept his intentions quiet, observed all the niceties, treating the papal nuncio with great consideration so as to encourage the Pope to get those papal bulls signed as quickly as possible. And within a few short months, all will be done and over with. We turn now to Cranmer's method of liturgical composition, an article by Brian Spinks. Cranmer's liturgical methods, a variety of methods and sources. In preparation for the 1989 alternative source book of the Church of England that was tossing out Cranmer's prayer book, had produced from 1965 onwards a number of experimental services called Series 1, 2, and 3. Although this was an innovation in the whole church was given a chance to use these services and comment on them, the idea of liturgical experiments in a series of rites had precedent in Thomas Cranmer. His interest, or rather experimentation with liturgical forms, began early, or began during the reign of Henry VIII. Manuscript Royal 7b4 in the British Library contains two early attempts by Cranmer at revising morning and evening prayer. Both schemes are in Latin, but the second scheme is more conservative than the first. It would seem that the scheme dates from about 1538, when Luther fluted, flirted with Lutheran alliances, and the more conservative scheme B would date from 1543, when there was a Catholic reaction. In those experiments, the offices are pruned and the material is compressed into two services, morning and evening prayer, as he was able to do in the later prayer books. His first public liturgical work was the English Litany of 1544, and a letter suggests that he was experimenting with a revised processional. It was not until 1548, after Henry's death, that the first major liturgical innovation occurred. In 1548, a royal proclamation was issued attached to the order for Holy Communion. The latter was an English communion devotion designed to be inserted in the Sarah Missal. 
and made provision for communion in both kinds, something the Lutherans had been wanting. The proclamation stated that the most earnest intent was further tra to travail for the Reformation and the setting forth of such godly orders, and a rubric prescribed that the rite then used would stand only the other, that the other be provided. Indeed, it was soon replaced in the Book of Common Prayer in 1549. But even as this liturgy was just off the press, Husser could claim that it was only a temporal thing. This led E.C. Ratcliffe and A.H. Curitan to suggest that Cranmer had envisioned a series of reforms, 1548, 1549, 1552 and a further book on account of the accession of Mary and Cranmer's downfall never materialized. The 1552 use of the surplus, the cross in baptism and the ring in marriage were ceremonies alien to more advanced Protestants. And in Gaz as Gazette and Bishop noted, innovating tendencies were still at work and were manifested in the Catechism and the Articles issued in 1553. Furthermore, there was rumor amongst the Marian exiles, reported by William Whittingham, that Cranmer had been preparing another prayer book a hundred times better than the one now in use. We have no liturgical evidence to support this rumor, but it could well have been that Cranmer had in mind yet further revision. In the space of only a few years, Strasbourg, for example, had some 20 or so revisions, and so an extended series of revisions was not unprecedented. And now for <clears throat> Jasper Ridley, ever clear. Um, he's now 1540 and the fall of Thomas Cromwell. At the end of May, Sampson, he's of Chichester, I believe, who two hours before had been appointed to be the first bishop of the new diocese of Westminster, was arrested on charge of treason. Sampson had been engaged in a series of lectures at St. Paul's and Cranmer now took his place and lectured at St. Paul's in the first week of June. He presumably dealt with justification in his lectures, for he is said to have refuted the doctrines which Gardner had put forward in the Lenten sermons. His controversy during his controversy with Robert Barnes. But it is unlikely that Doc Cranmer went beyond the doctrine laid down in the bishop's book, which on the subject of justification gave full opportunity for a difference in emphasis between Cranmer and Gardner. In the hour of triumph, the struggle for power ended in the irrevocable defeat when Cromwell was arrested at the council table on June 10. It seems clear from Cranmer's letter to Henry that he was actually present at the meeting of the council and witnessed, no doubt in silence, the disgraceful scene when Norfolk tore the cross of St. George from Cromwell's neck and all the lords of the council insulted him as he was hustled to the tower. Marillac wrote to Mortmancy that Cromwell's faction had been completely routed by Cromwell's arrest, for his only supporters were Cranmer, who did not dare open his mouth. And Russell, the Lord Admiral, who had long since learned to bend all winds. Cranmer did, however, dare to open his mouth and the next day wrote the famous letter, which survives only in the form in which it was published by Lord Herbert in 1649. Lord Herbert states that the faithfully transcribed letter from the original, and though he obviously omitted the formal words at the beginning and end of the letter, 
it is not clear whether the text is otherwise complete. Herbert it writes that Cranmer intervened on Cram Cromwell's behalf, for though, as in his letter, he heard yesterday in his grace's counsel that he was a traitor, yet he saith he cannot be sorrowful and amazed that he should be a traitor against your majesty, he that so, was so advanced by your majesty, he whose surety was only by your majesty, he who loved your majesty as I ever thought, no less than God. He who studied always to set forward whatever was your majesty's will and pleasure, that he cared for no man's displeasure to serve your majesty. He was such a servant in my judgment, in wisdom, diligence, faithfulness, and experience as no prince in this realm ever had. But he was so vigilant to preserve your majesty. But he detected in the same, in the beginning, if the noble princes of memory, King John, Henry II, Richard II, had had such a counselor about them, I suppose that he should never have been so traitorously abandoned and overthrown as those good princes were. After which he says again, I loved him as my friend, for I so took him to be. But I chiefly loved him for the love which I saw him bear ever towards your grace, singularly and above all others. But now if he be a traitor, here he's doing what he did with the Anne Boleyn, if he be a traitor, I am sorry that ever I have loved him, same storyline, and trusted him. And I am very glad that his treason is discovered in time. But yet again, I am very sorrowful. For who shall your grace trust hereafter if you might not trust him? Alas, I bewail and lament your grace's chance herein. I wot not whom your majesty may trust, but I pray God continually night and day to send such a counselor in his place whom your grace may trust, and for who all his qualities can and serve your grace like him. This, close quote, this letter has often been compared to that which Cranmer wrote after the arrest of Anne Boleyn. I'm one of them, just made that observation. He was a bit of toadying in that, too. And both letters have been portrayed as courageous intercession, as well as a cowardly betrayal of a fellow patron. That's where I am at, and Cromwell. We now bring this session and section on Cranmer studies to a close. If the Lord be for us, who can be against us? I am convinced that nothing but nothing <clears throat> can se separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end amen godspeed